that was one thing that was brought up when we would try and talk about finances. I was told that I was always in my masculine energy and it really messed with my head. Hello, and welcome to Lanisha's podcast, Future Rich. I'm your host, Barbara Ginty, and I'm also a CFP, which is a certified financial planner. And I am very excited to welcome our guest today, Jessica. Hi, Jessica. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Will you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your submission? So we we haven't had, I don't think we've had a guest like this in a bit. We had this very early on in this show. Yeah. Um, so I am 30 years old. I'm almost 31, like in two weeks. So I'm hanging on to the 30 as long as I can. Um, I am a project manager for a medical device company. I'm a nurse by education. Um, and I work I work remotely, but I live in the Milwaukee area. My company's based out in Boston. So I'm very fortunate to, you know, get the perks of remote work. Um, but I get the, I get the nice pay of, you know, like the medical device community out East. So that's been a real that's, blessing. That feels like a win. Yeah. It's a win. Okay. And then how much do you make annually? So I have a base salary of 127,000. Uh, I okay. get a 12% bonus. Uh, and then I also get restricted stock units. So this year, it'll probably be a total amount of 156000 That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Did you start as a nurse? I did. I started as a nurse where I was um, working at an outpatient clinic. And I think okay. that year I only made about $30,000 annually. So it's right. gone up considerably. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I, I remember when I wrote into you... Um, I've been listening to your podcast, like I've just been binging it because I love hearing about all of these different women and where they come from. Um, and you did one a while back with your editor and you guys talked about the differences in um, income or dating somebody or being with somebody that um, or dealing with financial infidelity, which I thought was really interesting. And actually, over a year ago, I was supposed to get married. So I was engaged and I called off my wedding probably six weeks before the date Oof. um okay and what yeah it was it was an easy decision at the That's same close. time it was very difficult yeah yes. yeah it was um but we were living together i had previously owned a condo in the downtown milwaukee area i had sold it when we got engaged thinking that the real estate market was gonna it wasn't gonna be as hot and boy was i wrong because mm -hmm. it's like the Milwaukee area, you still can't buy anything and prices are crazy. Um, but I sold my condo. I'm he he lived in Illinois, so I moved to go live with him. Okay. And then like six weeks before the wedding, all of this stuff came out. And I give him credit because he basically said, I feel like I've been pretending to be somebody in order to be with you and I don't want to do that anymore. And I realized, okay, well then we obviously can't get married. And I was the one that was financing the wedding and because of our income disparities, he was always very insecure about how much I was okay. making. And in being insecure, when I tried to talk about finances, it turned into a fight and it turned into a conversation oh. where, yeah, where I was. It was like a battle, not a conversation. Exactly. Um, and when I would try and bring it up, it would turn into a convert. It would turn into a fight where it was, well, you're only concerned about money. And because I had no idea what his expenses looked like, I got very tight with mine, especially with financing mm -hmm. the wedding primarily on my own. Um, and then when I ended things and I came back to him and said, okay, well, I looked up everything that the wedding was going to cost and with canceling and not getting deposits back, this is what you owe me if we split it halfway down the middle. And he said, I have no money to pay you back. Um, and I, it turns out that there was a lot of insecure spending that he was doing on his end where, um, okay. he, I think in an attempt to show me that he cared about me or to sh kind of hide insecurities, he was spending a lot when he definitely couldn't afford to. Um, so he basically, yeah, he, he had no money whatsoever to pay me back and it turned into a situation where I had to move back in with my parents. I'm still there. You can see my. I'm in my childhood bedroom with pink walls. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, so that was a little humbling. 
Um, but I really took that as an opportunity to really buckle down and just mm-hmm. really focus on saving. And that's always something that not always something I've been good at, but it's been something that I've been really good at educating myself on. Um, mm-hmm. and really kind of owning the fact that I am good with money and I'm proud of what I earn. And just because you are a high earner and you're a good saver or, and you're very independent in that way, that doesn't make you a masculine individual. Cause that was one thing that was brought up when we would try and talk about finances. I was told that I was always in my masculine energy and it really messed with my head. Yes. I also have been told I have a lot of masculine energy. You can be successful and still have feminine energy. I think, you know, and I think that you would not that we do relationship advice on this podcast. And honestly, if we right. did, like nobody would listen because I'm horrible. But I think that you just need somebody who is self, you know, self-assured and, and secure in who they are. And then it isn't as much of an issue, right? Because I mm-hmm. agree that if he was spending money he didn't have, that was either delusion of like, maybe next month I'm going to make the money, which is also a problem, right? Mm-hmm. You have to be rational. So if you think all of a sudden you're going to start making money next month or the following month, you're going to figure it out. It's a little bit of delusion in my opinion. Um, or it's insecure. So you're doing something to make yourself feel better, which it sounds like it's one or the other with him. But I ag- agree. I don't think, and I do, and I think this is, talk, don't, I don't think it's talked about a lot. We did talk about it, I think, with my producer, is I do think when you're a female and you're successful and independent and you don't need somebody, right? You want somebody, but you don't need a partner, right? You'll be fine on your own and you'll be successful on your own. You were successful before him, you'll be successful after him. And so I think when you don't need somebody, it's a little bit of a different footing for the relationship, right? You're choosing to be with the person. It's a choice, but you don't need them for anything. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny that you say that because one time when we were having an argument he said, you know, it's frustrating because you don't need me. And I remember so vividly, I didn't even have to think about responding. I said, no, I don't, but I want you. And don't, wouldn't you rather be with somebody that wants to be with you as opposed to And chooses to every time. Yeah. yeah. Choose it, chooses to be with you on a regular basis. And it's not because of a financial need or any other thing relating to money. It's a choice, right? Um, yeah. yeah, I agree. But I do think my personal opinion, I do think it makes it a little bit harder as a female yeah, when you does. are in control of your own finances, which is the whole reason I do the podcast is I am very, I feel very, very strongly that women need to understand their own finances always, whether or not you're in a relationship, you need to know, which is why we only bring on a female guest, because I think often it's really easy to hand that off and then turn a blind blind eye. And hopefully you're turning a blind eye, everything goes fine, but often it doesn't go fine. If there's a problem in the relationship now, you also didn't know about your financial situation and maybe there was a problem there, or maybe now you're needing to learn something in the midst of some other, you know, emotional distress. So I think it's a great thing that you make your own money, that you're successful financially. And I'm sorry that it happened to come out through the relationship that that would, but I think it's, it was him. It was just, he was insecure about not having equal footing. And that's something he has to work on. You can't change that, right? You shouldn't right. tone down your success to make your partner more comfortable. Yeah. And it it was definitely a little bit of a shift because I grew up in a household where I, I had wonderful parents. They did such a good job. But they're, you know, I come from a very conservative Catholic household where it's, you know, you get married, you have children. And I had it in my head, like, okay, by the time I'm 30 years old, I need to be married and at least considering starting a family. And then all of this happened. And I realized, yeah, that wasn't such a great idea to like, put such a hard deadline on something as big as choosing a life partner. Um, So now my perspective has been, it shifted considerably, just seeing how bad that could have gone. I'm thinking to myself, yeah, marriage is no cup of tea, especially if it's with the wrong person like you you need to you need to be with somebody that shares the same values and is not and is supportive of your goals um so something that i've really shifted in thinking over for the next like 10 years it's like okay well what how do i envision my life being how do i how do i want to grow as an individual over the next 10 years not even factoring in a life partner 
um, of course, that would be wonderful. I do want to share my life with somebody, mm -hmm. but at this point, I'm not holding myself back or I'm not going to dim my own light just to appease somebody else to say that I'm with someone. Yeah, um, you don't need to. Yeah. I, so I, I just got it at 39. So there's hope. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it, the hope. more and more I, yeah. And the more I talk to women that I really admire in my, in my workplace, they always like they've gotten married later and they're doing really well and they're so happy that they didn't rush into anything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the over like something that I did want to talk to you about today is over the next 10 years, like I've been thinking more and more about it and how I want to put my money to work and not necessarily. I'd like to be financially independent from my current job. I love what I do, mm -hmm. um, but I would love to get to a point where I am able to buy a business and okay. have some cash flow coming in that way. Uh, and then the other thing that I have been thinking about is buying my childhood home from my parents. Okay. And that's something that's at minimum like 10 years down the road. Um, so these are okay. lofty goals. And I have time, but I'd like to start planning those so that when the time comes, I have the financial footing to execute them. Yep, to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are all all great goals. So yeah, why don't we dive into what your expenses are now and like where you are with savings and debt? Yeah, uh, so no debt, um, no student loans. Okay, so you paid the you got the wedding paid off yeah luckily i had a very big slush fund for that so i just okay. paid it all in cash and did you ever get the money from he, him or did you end up paying everything? no so he did not pay me back at all for any of the wedding expenses i did put his suit on my credit card because he couldn't afford it at the time and he did say i'll pay you back for the suit so he paid me in 200 hundred dollar monthly installments for one year to pay me back so that was a little over two thousand dollars so i did get something back it wasn't yeah, okay total i probably paid about fifteen thousand dollars out of pocket okay to walk away from that mm -hmm. but, but better i think better. to have walked away yeah than have gone through it and what was it the impetus was that you were sitting down going crunching all the numbers for the wedding and it started a big fight or um, how did it how did it happen? I, you know, it was, I came home from a work trip and I remember I was exhausted. I came home at like six in the morning and he had a therapy session. And that's, I, that's what I liked about him is that he was seeing a therapist before we even started dating each other, which I mm -hmm. thought was a big green flag. And I guess it was, he just hadn't worked out everything, but he said, yeah, basically I've been pretending to be somebody that I'm not in order to be with you. And I want to, he wanted to postpone the wedding for okay. in, he didn't specifically say how long, but he wanted to push the wedding off so that he could focus on being more honest about who he is. And at that point, I said, okay, well then, if that's truly the case, then we shouldn't be getting married at all because you've been pretending to be somebody that you're not. And then after I had left and I, on my own, went through and tallied up all of the uh, wedding costs. Expenses. Yes. And I called him and was like, okay, well, if we were to split it down the middle, this is what you would owe. And I said, here are the receipts. I backed it all up. Um, and he said, I, right. I absolutely can't pay you back. And that's what it came out like, okay, that's like, you were spending money on things that we definitely could not afford. Yeah. And you didn't realize that. And I had no idea. Like there was one night we went out dancing and he ordered bottle service. And I clearly like, at, and now it, looking back, it makes so much more sense. I'm like, yeah, well, you, we should, we didn't need to spend three hundred dollars on a bottle of tequila that was worth fifty. Like, and it was one of those right. things where it's never a good idea. No, <laughs> and he, you know, yeah. he was. He, I, he tried to reassure me and was like, no, I just got my tax refund. It's okay. Like, I can afford this. And I'm like, I mean, I'm like, are you putting ten percent towards investments like we talked about? And he was like, yeah, of course I'm going to do that. And then I realized that he indeed was not. So. So he would just of, yes you to death. He would yes, like, yeah. yes, I'm doing it. Yes, I can afford it. Yes, exactly. Well, I honestly I think fifteen thousand. No one wants to lose fifteen thousand, but it could have been a lot. It was, you worse. know, I I tell everybody I'm like fifteen thousand was the cost of my freedom, and I would pay it again. So right, yeah. Because someday I we've had a couple. I think we've had two guests on, and then one expert who had had financial infidelity, and sometimes the numbers can be a bit large. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's good. Okay, so no debt. So no student loan debt, no no debt from the relationship. And then how are you doing with savings? 
savings, I have about $40,000 in a high yield savings account. Great. Okay. And then do you have a work retirement plan? I do. Um, So I have an old 401k through my company. My company was bought out a year ago. And I I guess because of the IRS rules, I can't roll that over into the new company 401k. I don't know. I was just told I can't. Um, But in my old 401k, I have about 106,000. And then in my current 401k, I have 25,200. And then and do you get a, a match? I do. I get, it's, how do they phrase it? It's up to 75% of the first 6%. I don't know, like, who sits in a room and is like, let's make this really confusing. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just they want you to up your contribution, but they don't want to yeah. match dollar for dollar. Okay, that's good. So you have a match up to 75% of the first 6%. And then you said you also have a Roth? I do. I haven't been contributing just because I know I'm teetering on the edge. You're teetering. Yeah. I have about, I'd say 15000 in a Roth. Okay, great. Yeah. you're Okay. So for the Roth, your modified adjusted gross income for 2024, you start to phase out at 146000 of income and you're completely phased out at 161000 yeah. So depends on what your accountant says for that. But even if, mm-hmm. yeah, it's not going to be a full amount. That's why you're, you're doing well. And then how much do you have uh, total with your RSUs? Total right now unvested is about, I'd say, 43000 Okay, great. And how long do you have to stay there for it to, everything to vest? And I know they probably uh, keep issuing them every year, so it's a rolling. Yeah. Um, so typically for the last two years, I've gotten $26,000 of RSUs annually. A third of it vests once every three years. Um, a third vests every year. A third vests every year. Okay. Like, I think I got my... my, my First RSU payout through my company since we merged was actually at the beginning of June. Okay. And that was $8,000 before tax. And then is there anything else I should know about? I have a lot of money in after-tax brokerage accounts. Well, how much? (laughs) And that's the other thing, too. I have a lot of after-tax brokerage accounts. I have, like, four. Okay. So one of them has $35,000. Okay. The other one has about 15000 okay. And then I have about $22,000 in single stocks. Okay. And about $1,200, i am sorry, uh, 12000 in an account, a Fundrise account. Okay. And one account, well, this was a, a very silly investment I did when I was younger and didn't really understand what I was doing, but it's called VinoVest. It's like a, a wine investing account. <laughs> Um, oh really? Yeah, I was like think I was teaching myself about how to diversify my money and I kept okay. seeing ads on all of these influencers pages about, you know, like investing in wine. Investing in wine. Like, yeah, and I was like, oh, "Okay, that sounds like a good idea." And luckily, I only put in $2,000. So it's not a substantial a substantial sum. Okay. So right now it's sitting at 2000 7 $2,070. $7. So um, you made seventy dollars on that one. Yeah, two thousand seventy dollars. Okay. So you have about eighty six thousand total. Yes, I would say so. Great, that's fantastic. Okay, anything else that you know about? I guess in terms of expenses, uh, my expenses are very low. Yeah, let's talk about your expenses. Yeah, so I I live at home with my parents. Um, I live rent free. Um, my parents are very generous, and we have a really wonderful relationship. So that's a very it's great positive, fortunate thing. Yeah. So my take home is probably I get paid bi weekly and my take home is about twenty seven hundred. I probably okay. I save about fifteen hundred a month. I probably spend no more than two thousand and the rest I just throw into after tax accounts. After tax accounts. Okay. And how long have you been living at home? Since last March. So March of twenty twenty three. Okay. So and then so you're able to save a ton. That's how you've accumulated yeah. Okay. Perfect. So I guess I don't need to. I normally think when people come on the show, I'm really like, okay, we're going to save for it. So I don't think I need to do that with you. No. <laughs> you don't have any no, I'm pretty good expenses. At that. <laughs> Taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should at least be simple. That's why for the last three years, I've been drinking AG1 every day with no exceptions. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day, and it makes me feel ready to take on my day. That's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, 
and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. With AG1, I know I'm getting essential brain, gut, and immune health support with vitamins, probiotics, and nutrients from Whole Foods. I like to think of it as my nutritional insurance. I know I'm covering my nutritional basis from the very start of the day. If there's one product I had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1, and that's why I've partnered with them for so long. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com forward slash future rich. That's drinkag1.com forward slash future rich. Check it out. Well, then let's talk a little bit about buying a business and then buying a home. So I would say at this stage, you're set up really well for both. So having no debt, I think is critical. Uh, let's start with buying a, buying a business. I think it's really go good to go into buying a business with having a lot of cash on hand. Sometimes you mm-hmm. have to, depends on how you buy the business. It depends on what type of business, how they're going to be valuing the business and then like what the expectation is for purchase. Um, usually it's structured over time. Okay. So, well, I guess it just depends what you're buying. But if we talked about like a personal service business, You'd buy it based on the, the revenue. You'd want to retain the clients. You wouldn't put it. You wouldn't pay a hundred percent. Some businesses, like a website, you might buy it all at once, right? Website mm-hmm. to the same. You're getting recurring traffic. But if there's like a client list or anything like that, you'd only would pay a percentage. Now there'd be have to be some make sure there's retention of the clients, right? So buying a business is pretty broad, but I think that to put yourself in a strategic position to buy a business is where you are now, right? So you Mm -hmm. have low expenses, no debt, and a lot of after-tax money because when you're going to go buy a business, you're going to need after-tax money. Um, And it would be the same for a home, right? So you're going to want 20% ideally down to buy a home so you don't have primary mortgage insurance, right? So you have the down Mm -hmm. payment. I wouldn't advise doing both at the same time. Right. So I think that from a 10-year standpoint, I think where I would put it, and this is personal preference, is I'd almost do the business first and get the cash flow going, and then maybe from there do the home. I will say by doing it that way, it will be harder to qualify for a home because when you go to get a home, they don't love entrepreneurs. You will still get approved, but the process is more difficult because you don't have a W-2, and they're going to want to see a longer time horizon. So that said, if you buy a business, you're going to need to have that set revenue and have consistent income to get approved for a mortgage. If you do the reverse, which is buy a home first, I would spread out then buying. I think either way you're going to have, I would recommend a time gap between both. If you buy the home first, you're going to use up more of your cash. Um, You're going to have higher expenses. I just think it will put a bit of pressure on you for the business because if the business isn't generating the cash flow you need, you still have to make a mortgage payment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And in terms of buying a business, like this is, I'm very early in, I haven't even talked to any mm-hmm. brokers yet or consultants. Is there a certain amount of cash that you recommend? So it's, let's just say that I'm focused on buying a business that's, that is going for $500,000. Could I, do I need to have a certain what kind of business? Of on hand? Um, I don't even know yet at this point. I, obviously, I want, to, I, I want to buy a business, not another job. I guess that's what I, I I'd like for it to be a little bit more hands off. Mm-hmm. That's not helping answer the question. But like right now. I don't I go... know many businesses that are super hands off initially. Okay. okay. I could be wrong. Here's my, here's my attitude about. I don't think real estate is passive in the right. regards that, I mean, everyone who's listening to the podcast knows I have, my house here in Utah has been like pretty easy. The one in New York has been like, it's like my problem child. I don't think it's as passive. It can be when it go, when it, when you have a good tenant and there's no problems with the property and no problems with the tenant, it can go smoothly. That is not guaranteed, right? And so real estate isn't in my mind. If you go into it thinking you're just going to get a check, yeah, you could hire a management company and turn a blind eye. But usually when you put a lot of money into something, you care. Yeah. Right? So like you're a successful, I'm going to guess type A person, you know, you get things done. So if you hire a property management company and then the tenant's calling you because property manager didn't answer, it's going to really annoy you. You're giving 25% to them when they're not getting it done. 
it, it can go swimmingly, but it, it's not guaranteed to go swimmingly. It, I, I think of it the same way. You can have a job that's like really easy. You go in, you like it, you make a good amount of money. It's the same way with the business. You could buy a business, everything goes swimmingly, you make good money, it's fairly easy, but you could also buy a business that requires a lot of work or has a really bad year. So I would just go into it more with the mindset that it, not necessarily yeah. that you're buying a job because some businesses you're literally just buying yourself a job, but others mm-hmm. like you might have to get it. You have to put some work in to get it to where you want it to be. Does that make okay. sense? Like maybe the yeah. owner is running the business. And so maybe then you have to look at the revenue and say, okay, I don't want to be the one running the business every day. So now I need to hire a manager. Mm-hmm. So then the profit margin is going to be different because I'm going to have to have more staff, stuff like that. So I would start investigating. My advice would be like, start investigating it now. And if it's selling for 500000 my guess would be the revenue is somewhere around, what, 150000 a year? Probably, yeah. Right? Yeah, I would say so. Give or take, okay. using a 3x gross revenue multiple. Mm-hmm. So usually this is a sell for some multiple, depends on industry. But if we just use three, then it's generating 150000 a year and you're going to buy it for, let's just say 450 Okay. So then it depends on the type of business, like how that would be structured. Okay. So one thing that I have thought about, I have a brother. He is a little bit younger than me, but he's an accountant. He is working to get his CPA right now. And I did float the idea with him, like, hey, how would it be if like we bought a cpa firm together and obviously you being the tax practice yeah like but you being the cpa understanding how it all works can help with the operations so okay i love that idea there's also franchises for tax practices Uh okay so if you want a roadmap and they tell you exactly what to do exactly how to run it so because i think there's twofold with a business one there's how do you run a business right that's a skill set like yeah. what type of insurance do you need? Like all the things you need to think about with, oh, I like, I talked to a girlfriend of mine who's been in corporate America and I was like, oh, we'll just throw up a website. And she was like, I don't know how to build a website. And I was like, really? you don't have, when you work for a company, they don't say, hey, we want to update the website. Could you handle that? Like, but when you're an entrepreneur right. and you're like, oh, I need to update the website. Like you hire someone to do the website, but if you just need to tweak it, I can't go back to you. Well, you could hire someone every week to say, actually, I need to update, blah, blah, blah. You just le- learn how to do stuff as an entrepreneur, right? Just faster. Mm-hmm. So learning how to run a business is step one. A franchise, I think, takes a lot of that away. They tell you where to do it, how to run it, like all the things, like where do you get the stationery printed? Who hosts the website? Who designed, like all that is gone, right? They help you with that. The other part is like, what are you offering as the business? And is that a skill set? So like your brother, for instance, would have the skill set of the tax returns having the licensure, right? So it's like a little bit twofold. So you could almost be the operator Mm -hmm. for the business. And he could be the, the actual skills that you need to execute the business. I think, um, I actually just talked also with my brother a lot about this. I think if you've researched the tax return, like CPA, in terms of retail, so like CPA working with individuals for tax returns, there's a huge shortage, absolute massive shortage. So much so that they're recruiting at like the college level because there are so few people going into the field and the field is so, the general age is so high. Um, so I think that to me see, makes a ton of sense. I also think the tax return business is very interesting because if you don't mind working really hard for a set period of time, it is easier the rest of the year. So tax season, and if you're a CPA, then you can do businesses and trust. Mm-hmm. So those go into later extensions. And so maybe your timing isn't, you you know, you're working a little longer, but those are higher priced items than a regular okay. return. But if business mm-hmm. pays a lot more, a trust pays more when it gets more complicated. And generally, you want a CPA for those types of, mm-hmm. I'm just saying like non-W2. Um, so I think that's a really interesting concept. And I think that tax practices you could buy in and probably the owners are, there's so many baby boomers retiring, they would want to get out. And you could go in and see how it's running and then see how to structure it. And with that, there'd be recurring rev or somewhat recurring revenue, right? They would have a client mm-hmm. base for the most part. And I think that would be a little easier to finance. Yeah. I think that's a really good idea, actually. 
now mm-hmm. that because yeah there are a lot of baby boomers that are retiring a lot so you could do two so what i would investigate if i were in your shoes knowing that you want to do this down the road is I would investigate in your local area who are the tax practices and I would cold call them now over the summer while they're not during tax returns. Yeah. Um, or look on their website, see who's older. And then if it's a solo person who's older, I would call and say like, what's your plan? We're interested in getting into the tax return business. My brother's a CPA, blah, blah, blah. And then I would also investigate the tax return franchises and let okay. them tell you what they offer and what the buy-in. I would see what the numbers look like. Because if you buy in now, it could be over a five-year period. The older CPA stays for five years, is paid out over five, bridges it between, you know, it's a relationship business, right? So then you're bridging it. It's not, you know, they retire one day, you ease them into retirement. Yeah. That to me would be interesting. That's I would do some research on like, would you want to buy a private practice? And, you know, take a business that's already successful and buy into it. Or do you want to go the franchise route? And Mm -hmm. there's options for both with that specific. And I think it's a very underserved market. And so to me, as long as you like the concept of tax returns. Yeah, I I do. It's funny because I I remember when I was in high school and my mom was asking me what I wanted to be when I went to college. I was like, I don't know. Like, I like history. I might go and major in history. And my mom being very rational and German said, no, go be a nurse. You'll you'll get a job immediately. So I did what she told me to do. And I don't regret it. I'm very like I've done very well for myself. I really like my job. Um, But over the last few years, as I've educated myself more on personal finance, like I really enjoy the nitty gritty and the numbers. And I would love to make a transition to work more within so, that field. So here's yeah. what I think if I were you, I would investigate both, talk to your brother. And then I think what I would do, I'm just going to take a guess, you're probably in a better financial situation if he sold school or getting He's, the CPA. So- he actually, so he he is an accountant. He's got a, he's studying for his CPA okay. right now. So he does work full time. He also, okay, he also lives at home. So he's got a good financial situation too. Because what I was going to say is, you could always keep your job and be the financial backer because he's mm-hmm. going to be doing the returns. And because, like, let's say for instance, in theory, you find a solo practitioner. He has like one or two people working for him during tax season, but it's really just. And I'm going to say. Him, I haven't met that woman. Many women, older accountants, maybe they're there, but the soul its a solar person, solo person. So the business might not be able to support two salaries, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe it starts as just him. You're the backer, helping pay off the note. Your fifty-fifty partners, or whatever you decide to do, and then the goal is when we get revenue up to X, then you can come in as the operator, or or maybe you start doing simple returns and you get your enrolled agent, but. Mm. You could do it that way, right? So then there is less financial pressure on the business because the business is not having to support two people. And you, it starts with him because he'll be the CPA, the practitioner. You're the financial backer helping pay off the note. You're both equity owners. And then you, when you target what the revenue needs to be for it to support both of you, mm-hmm. and then you ease your way into it. That's a, yeah, I did not. I guess I just, I, yeah, my advice would just be like, not to do both at the same time if you could avoid buying a house and buying a business or right. ease into it, right? Like if you're easing into the business and you're helping financially support him, but you're staying W-2, then you could buy a house on top of that if you wanted to. But you you can definitely do both. You're saving enough money. So the it's it's all very, they're all options. I think if I were in your shoes, you could always buy a house, right? Everyone does that. Buying a business is a little harder, a little bit more mm-hmm. involved. I think I think personally having bought multiple properties and then <laughs> also houses. Houses is a lot really stressful like one time, but then you're in the mm-hmm. house. And then there's like never a small expense in a house. It's always like right, has three zeros. Buying a business is a little harder. There's like a lot of things always going. You want to make sure it's working, you know. I guess if you think about the failure rate, like buying a business has a ha- much higher failure rate than buying a home and going yeah. closure, right? Like statistically, mm-hmm. most people, less people lose their homes, more people lose businesses or mm-hmm. businesses don't work. So I think I would lean towards investigating that now while you have a nice living situation and then see what that looks like. Would you go the franchise route, solo practitioner route, and then map out the timing from there? And then based on that, I would decide about the house. Okay, that sounds good. 
kind of going off the franchising versus buying a private tax um, or independent tax corporation. The other mm-hmm. thing that I was thinking about was, or I wanted to get your feedback on financial coaching because I do see that more and more people are doing that. Yeah, a lot of people and are I, doing it. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's just more so focused on like helping people establish a budget. You're not providing any investment advice. Like, I'm not. It wouldn't be a CFP. Get out of role. debt. Right. No. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that? I would call it like what I here's what I would say. Like, I think there's a good need for it because like. Okay. So with with the CFP, right? It took, I think, around two. I did accelerate it, but two years for the classwork, right? To get all the classes done. And then I think you studied like four or 600 hours for the exam. And then my exam was two days and 10 hours. So it's like very high level finance, personal finance. Financial coaching is on the other extreme. And it, it makes sense because why would you pay for a CFP to go over debt? Yeah. Like I can do, yeah, like you should take a HELOC versus not take a HELOC, whatever. Like easy debt. Mm-hmm. Uh, or like, more leverage, I guess, is what a CFP would help you with. Like, when do you leverage debt? But if you just have credit card debt and student loan debt, you can pay for a CFP, but we're expensive, right? And so mm-hmm. I think the financial coaching is like a really good, like, you're getting into this, you know that your situation is not set up the way you want it to be, and you want to get to the other side. Like, who's going to help you figure out your money? Like, square one. So mm-hmm. I, I think it serves a really good need. And there are coaching designations that you can get. And I like that because sometimes people come into our office and like, I don't, for for like to work with me doesn't really make sense for you with my price point if we have all this debt. <laughs> right. Like it makes sense to work with somebody. So I actually like that idea as well. I really do think there's a huge opportunity with the doing tax returns. Like if you just okay. look at that industry. And it's not to say that you don't segue that, like there isn't a financial coaching option tied to the tax practice for people who come in and it's kind of a mess. You could Mm -hmm. say like, we also have a coaching program that we could put you in for a year trying to improve this. So they're in the same vein. Okay. So I don't think if you did one, you can't do the other. If you did one with the CFP and stuff, you would probably have a conflict of interest. Like there's like a more regulation and stuff, but like with financial coaching, as far as I know, I don't think it's particularly regulated. No, it's not. And I guess that's where the reservation kind of came from, because I know that you can get certifications, Ugh. but you don't necessarily have to. Um, and I was just I, like, I keep seeing that role pop up more and more and more. And I guess in the back of my head, I'm thinking, is there value in that or is that more gimmicky? Yeah, so I I do think there's value okay. in getting some financial coaching. I really think to me, it's like, and a little bit of money therapy is what I'd say. Mm, okay. Right? Like, okay, like, why are you overspending? Like, you know you don't have the money, right? Like, so, and accountability, right? Like, I, I'm not really your accountability partner. Mm-hmm. Some people need that. Just like, you know, they need a personal trainer. Or, you know, yeah. Some people, like, where it makes sense to hire someone to help you get through something. I think it can work. I like designations. Obviously, you got the RN. I got the CFP. I, I think there's value in education and finding out like, okay, like if I'm going to do this, like how should I structure it? And like, what is the recommendation? I don't know all of the coaching designations, but I, I do think that's a good idea. I think you just need to run, I think for you, I think you need to run the numbers on what will that generate and how much coaching are you going to do? And are you going to enjoy that work? Mm-hmm. Like, are you going to enjoy putting a budget, setting up a budget for someone, checking to see if they followed it, getting them out of debt? Or would you want like, because the tax return to me is like maybe a little, they're different roles. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes more sense. Yeah. It sounds like the coaching is, like you said, more accountability, more handholding, especially for those that need to get out of a situation as opposed to build wealth. Like you're, you're helping them get to the point where they can build wealth. If I want to yes. say yeah. That's okay. that's the way I would say it. And then when you're ready to build wealth, when it starts to get the way I think about it is like when it starts to get more complicated, to mm-hmm. me that's when you go see a CFP or someone at the next level. Okay. Gotcha. If you could talk to a financial coach and see if they agree with my analysis of their role. Okay. But <laughs> um I th- I think it's more because like you to me, like why would you go and pay so much money to get like advice to like pay off debt? Like I don't think you know you need to pay off debt. Right. Clearly, you I haven't guess, paid off debt. You need some help doing that. 
Right. That's that's where I've struggled with it, because, I mean, I I was in a, a lot of debt with student loans and a car loan at one point and a mortgage. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it was just, you know, prioritize and, you know, you have to cut down somewhere and you need to allocate more money towards yep. the debt. It's not that complicated. It's more so behavioral. No. And it's I think so, it's, yeah. it's behavioral. Yeah. Yes. And it, it being accountable. And I also think sometimes for some people, it's helpful to have somebody else let me look at it and I'm just going to tell you. They know there's a problem, but sometimes it's yeah. hard when you're in it to True. be like, how do I get out of it? You're like in the hole. You're like, no, you don't want to be here. You're like, I'm not sure how to get out. Sometimes it's helpful to have someone say like, oh, get out this way. Here's the way we're going to go. For, follow me and this is how we're going to get you out of it. Okay. That's valuable. I just would think about, I think both are interesting career paths. I just feel very strongly there are not enough. There's just not enough CPAs. There's just not enough accountants. I mm -hmm. think it's a huge issue. You could try both. I mean, the financial coaching is a lot easier to get into than buying a business. You can just start that. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, that's true. So. And then I could also, I could make it a point to target these, either these tax franchises or these independent businesses and be like, well, if you have any clients that are struggling with debt and maybe aren't good at tracking anything, I'd love to be a refer like I'd love for you to refer them to referral. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you bought it and you had already built the financial coaching on the side, right? Like if you were yeah. doing that on nights and weekends and you liked it and then you bought a tax practice and let's just say they had a thousand clients, well then you just email out to the thousand clients you just purchased. We also mm -hmm. offer financial coaching. Because if you just bought Is a business something? with a thousand people. This I don't know if this is a dumb question or not, but could I go to businesses within my area and purchase their client list to use for referrals or could I just ask them to it depends it so like an accountant I don't know if an accountant would but you could go in and say I'm offering financial coaching I'd like to offer your clients a discount like do you send a mailer out to your clients could I send something with your mailer like if, if mm -hmm. I give a dis if I give $20 off to all of your clients would you send it to your clients or something like that okay they okay. would have to approve it, and it depends on right. you know who they are and what who they like. I don't know with the franchise if they would, but a solo okay. practitioner might be fine. Okay, okay, that's good to know. Kind of off topic, but I did want to ask you about this too. So I haven't contributed to a traditional IRA this year yet, and you cannot, my... you cannot do, you cannot do a traditional IRA. I can, okay. Okay, well, I'm glad I did. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, you can't you can't do that because you're single and you're covered in uh, an employer plan, and so you'd have to make less than seventy seven thousand okay. dollars. So you can't when you have a workplace plan and you have good income, you can't do a traditional IRA. Okay, so through my company, I do have the opportunity to contribute after tax dollars to my four hundred one k. Yes, I yes. Okay, so I, I love this. That. This is called like a mega backdoor Roth. You can do after tax into your 401k and then just find out if they offer an in-plan conversion. So then those after-tax dollars, we'll just use round numbers. You put 10,000 in and we'll just say one lump sum, there's a big bonus. And then you want to be able to immediately convert it into the Roth. Okay. So the trick there is um, you don't want it to get invested and then convert it because then there's a fluctuation component. So you just want to have it, usually it's an immediate. You put it in after-tax, they immediately convert it to Roth. That's that's a great feature. Not many plans offer that. Um, and if you want to do some research on it, it's known as a mega backdoor Roth. That's like what, if you Googled, it'll talk about it. Okay. All right. I'll look into that. Perfect. Thank you. That's a huge help. Yeah. Amazing. Keep you posted on the business. I think that's super interesting. Yeah, I will. Thank you for this. This was super helpful. It was fun to bounce ideas off each other. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for coming on. And then for all of our lovely listeners, you can follow us on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. And if you like the show, uh, it would be a huge help if you could share it with a friend and like or subscribe. All right. Thank you. Time for our disclaimer. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance references are historical and do not guarantee future results. Make sure that you consult with your own legal, tax, and or financial advisor before making any decisions.